an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, psychotherapist, the author and the originator of the Awareness Integration Theory. And hello to Sean, our director at our studio. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our minds, our thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. Today, I will share with you the tip of the week about how to love our body, even in the midst of our illnesses. I chat with Dominique Brightman, an award-winning speaker and a certified member with the John Maxwell team. He's the best-selling author of Going North, Tips and Techniques to Advance Yourself. He hosts the Going North podcast and a top rater self-help podcast that interviews authors from all over the world. And um, his mantra is advance others to advance yourself. Then I bring you E.A. Solkovitz. Um, he is the founder of Givers University and the author of The Giver's Mindset, The Giver's Lifestyle, and The Giver's Lifelong Learning for the Gift to Be Great series. As you see today, it's all about giving and all about how to be for others. It's going to be an amazing show. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and podcast. I love to hear from you. So connect with me in any of the social medias that you have through Dr. Fujian Zane. And I love to hear from you through my um, podcast. I mean, podcast and um, website, fujianzane.com. But here first is the tip of the week. Here's the tip of the week. There's a surge in the I don't feel good experience due to the different strands of COVID-19, flu, or simple cold. People react differently to being sick, having to cancel their plans or work. Some people feel relieved that they can just stay home and go, oh, guilt-free, I can take care of myself. And um, some people get very agitated for having to miss work. Or social events. Others get angry at their body for getting sick. Some get angry at others and the world for getting them sick. Some think that they have so much to do they can't afford to be sick. And some literally can't afford to get sick due to financial restraint and not having the ability to go to work. So there is the illness itself, and then all the thoughts and emotions around the illness that is different for us. Any illness comes with its own set of discomfort and management. However, how we deal with an illness is the subject that I like to talk, ponder. We may think that our body is not us, and it is this object or a vehicle that is not working, and we get irritated at it. As if our car had a problem, and it is creating discomfort and an inconvenience for us. So we continue to be agitated at it for not working properly as it should. We may even punish it by withholding nutrition from it or even abusing it with unhealthy food, drugs, or alcohol. For many who have been physically or sexually abused or mistreated, it may be hard to even live in their bodies. I've worked with people who recall lifting off from their bodies when they were being hit or sexually molested. They never felt the same about their bodies. 
Many athletes learned to use their bodies for their sport and saw it only as a vehicle to win a trophy for them. Others were ashamed of their bodies, not being perfect or an attractive one, whether they were too thin or too fat or too tall or too short or just disfigured <clears throat> somehow and not to par with the latest fashion. And therefore they decided to abandon the body and punish it. Some act if who I am is in the head and the body starts from my neck down. But try to numb the brain with alcohol to drugs anyway. Some want to numb it all so that they just don't feel discomfort or pain and end up numbing all of their emotions. If we could view our body as part of the self, an amazing gift and the base of our operating system, then we will value it more. We sense the outside world through our bodies. We feel our emotions through our bodies. We get to be alive because of our bodies. So let's honor ourselves as our body and our psyche. Even for the ones who believe that their soul is different than their bodies, in this lifetime on earth, they only got one. They only get to be experiencing being on the earth through this body. I want to share this simple meditation with you, okay? So sit comfortably. Um, close your eyes. If you're not driving, if you're not driving, if you are, don't worry about it. Just watch the front of, <laughs> watch front of you and then listen. Begin breathing deeply into the bottom of your stomach and inhale to the count of four and then hold count of four and exhale to the count of four and then continue deep breathing and extend the exhale. So it'll be four, four, six, four, four, eight, four, four, ten. And as you continue breathing deeply, you just concentrate on extending your exhale and begin concentrating on your feet and toes and state your gratitude. Like, I love you and thank you for being with me. Thank you for helping me walk holding my balance and facilitating me moving around. Is there anything I can do for you? Is there anything you need from me? Listen to that part of your body responding. Take note of what each part of your body will share with you. Then go to your calves. I love you. Thank you with, for being with me. Thank you for allowing me to walk. Is there anything that you need from me? Is there anything I can do for you? And then go to your thighs and your pelvic and your back and all of your internal organs, one by one, your breasts, your lung, your arms, your hands, your fingers, neck, facial features, head, head brain, hair, all your parts. You'll begin connecting with your body in a whole new way. Love your body as is, listen to it, nurture it, and take care of yourself. If you need the recording of the meditation with my voice, which I have full on for your body, contact me, fujanzain at gmail.com. And I love to share with you all of those. Don't forget to get my book, Life Reset, The Awareness Integration Path to Create the Life You Want and to learn the skills of self-awareness and integration. And for all of you who are therapists and coaches out there, get my book with Awareness Integration ther um, Therapy so that you can work with yourself and your clients in that way. And um, we'll be right back.
Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm Dr. Pujan Zane, and I'm excited to be with Dominique Brightman today. He is an award-winning speaker and a certified member with the John Maxwell team. He is the best-selling author of Going North, Tips and Techniques to Advance Yourself and um, Stay the Course, The Elite Performance, Seven Secret Keys to Sustainable Success. He hosts the Going North podcast, a top rated self-help podcast that interviews authors from all over the world. And his mantra is advance others to advance yourself. Welcome to the show, Dom. Thank you, Dr. Fujian. Appreciate you for having me on. Let's have some fun on all the buns. Absolutely. Now, you talk about a lot of awareness in your book. You talk about the mental awareness, the time awareness, influence awareness, and much more. And I would love to go uh, through some of those with you in our show. Well, I'm sure thing. So anyone you want to start with? Mental one, it really helps. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's actually why it's the first one, actually, funny enough. Because uh, the thing is, like, mental health is definitely important. It's like brain care is the main care, to be honest. Because if your mind is right, everything else flows a lot easier. Now, notice I say flows a lot easier. Not saying life is going to be perfect. It's not perfect for anybody. <gasps> or easy. But the thing is, mental awareness is really all about making sure that you keep your mind fresh and keeping basically what in front of you make sure that it matters so listening to great things that'll inspire you lift you up that'll truly inform you like those listening to the show right now fabulous work if you subscribe to dr fujan's youtube channel another great opportunity for the visual stimulation of the mind because the thing is i actually even learned this after publishing the book that the eyes are actually the only exterior piece of our actual brain because it takes in so much light and that's even more reason why we have to be careful of what we put in front of our eyes and that's another reason why a lot of important logos out there for these big brands that we all know of like the nikes the mcdonald's like usually see the logo you automatically have an idea of what that company is and what they produce so making sure that brain care is the main care and making sure that you do things that'll help you to keep your mind healthy indeed heck even in the book itself mentions doing at least one new thing a day so that way you can keep your mind fresh as well whether it's taking a different route to work reading a new book heck even reading a different type of book i know with me personally 95 percent of what i read is nonfiction, and journeying off into a wonderful novel if heck even a wonderful novel that could even possibly bring you to tears is a great way to get yourself out there because no matter how good nonfiction books are, sometimes you need a great story written by a great author to really bring out the emotions out of you, especially when they hide some great, wonderful gems in their books. Absolutely. You're, you're very accurate about the mental um, and the brain health because that's the pretty much the, the one and only organ that makes a lot of the decisions. So the more that we create health on that round, then um, it you know it leads itself to our decision makings and um, our creations and results. You also talk about time awareness. Um, obviously, you know having um, everything happens in the present moment, but there's also the aspect of um, how do we utilize our time. So share with us what you mean by time awareness. Oh, my plum pleasing pleasure indeed. So for time awareness, another reason why I call it time awareness, because time management is a fallacy. We all have the same amount of time every week, every day, like 168 hours in a week, seven days a week, 24 hours in a day. Like, hey, we all get the same amount of time. It just depends on what you do with that time that you're allowed to be given. Heck, even wonderful thing that was even brought to my attention over the years, the fact that, hey, even though tomorrow's not promised, today is also not promised. So making sure that you try to live with intentionality and manage your attention as well, because the thing is, where your attention goes, that's where your time goes. In this present moment, like, am I fully in the conversation with Dr. Fujian? Is this person listening right now? Are they doing laundry while listening to this wonderful program? Are they really doing other things? Are they in the gym? Like, hey, like take, making the most out of their time, but also getting some great content while they're on the move and just taking advantage of the sand in this hourglass of life that we each and all have. So time awareness is being aware that we have time, but also making sure we dedicate our attention to doing the things that truly matters and heck, even being intentional living a life by design as opposed to a life by default. 
I like what you said, because I think there is a di definitely a distinction of when is it and how is it that we actually do need to pay full attention, be in the zone and bring all of our 100% attention to a conversation or to a state of being or something, a task that we're doing. And then there are tasks that we could do on an automatic basis and kind of like start it and let the rest of the body handle it while you pay attention to something else. And many times what we, uh, we can uh, take advantage of some of those times where our bodies can just do the automatic and uh, utilize those times in, a, in the best benefit as, as you talked about. Then you talk about influence awareness. Share a little bit about that. Ah, yes. <laughs> Funny enough, influence awareness could actually even tie in with the mental awareness as well because what we surround ourselves with eventually comes out of us like what we listen to is what we eventually become a funny <laughs> example i always like to bring up is the fact that back in 2012 where i was fat or a friend turned me on to these crazy guys on youtube called the hodge twins where they were speaking this southern accent and just listening to them for like a video a day from them eventually their southern accent came right out of me and i'm from baltimore maryland <laughs> i even got the doctor laugh because it's true and that's exactly what happens with somebody and i pick up their accent you're absolutely right <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So just making sure whatever we expose ourselves to, especially when it comes to the people around us too, like making sh the classic saying, show me your five friends and I'll show you your future. Like, hey, even another example of personal life as I was growing up in high school, my maximum weight was like a good 222, 30. It was a little bit of a fat kid, but my friends were skinny and I eventually became skinny towards the end of my high school tenure. And kept that up through college and even parts of early adulthood. But come time in the middle of the 20s, had different friends who were a little bit more uh, on the heavyweight side of the game, and I gained some weight. Now, granted, it wasn't all of their fault, too. I decided to have that donut that day. I decided to have the cream and the sugar and the coffee that morning. I still made the decision, but when your friends change, it's so true. You get to see it visually in your own life, especially when you focus on living your life by design and being intentional about your living. And now I'm on the path to where it's like, hey, got to give myself skinny again and being making sure that I put myself back on the right path with better habits. Um, as you say this story, I remember uh, a guest that I had, um, he was one of the highest level dentists in uh, New York. And I remember him talking and he said, you know, he used to live in an environment and um, his group of friends were um, a little bit of um, mischievous, let's say, friends in high school. <laughs> and he said, my father, he says, I was getting into that mischievous things too. And then my father saw that and um, started um, taking me in the afternoons after the school to a whole different environment, put me at tennis classes and put me in different classes. And he said, today, the difference that that made was that it, all of my friends at this point, they're either dead or in jail, the ones that were becoming mischievous. And um, that changed the course of my life where I hang, hung around with people who wanted to strive and move forward and, you know, uh, get themselves better inst instead of um, getting themselves into jail. So that just brought me to the conversation of what I had also heard from him and many other people. And, um, and that, yes. Um, peer influence, especially in younger years, are the most important factor to us. The, our whole world is our peers. So obviously, if we have a group in our, beside us who are um, shifting us into a place of, you know, living the environment of um, higher advancement in however they, they think the higher advancement is, um, then it could, shakes us and takes us to that place by itself. So awesome. Now, the next one is connection awareness. Share oh, about yeah. that. You, sound like, <laughs> you look like you're listening to the music. You've got the rhythm as you're talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's usually just me on the regular, especially when I'm in tune with somebody. So that's the usual thing for me. It's kind of hilarious when folks like that. I was like, hey, why are you moving all the time? Well, hey, might as well move and groove with it. But connection awareness. And folks are probably wondering, or 
catching on that all of these meld in together because connection awareness is all about always networking networking to the point where you're basically almost breathing by default where you're just connecting wonderful people with each other heck right? even being a magnet for what i like to call super special awesome humans mm -hmm. because heck even like you and i dr pujan like we have uh we have some folks in circles like from sacred stories publishing and like laura staley a wonderful guest you have on your show in the past and a few others heck even janet taylor who called herself the mom of 18 kids at one point like you being on a program actually you were both on a program too so like being able to put yourself out there and connect with other wonderful people and seeking to help others without any thing in return like kind of like my whole life motto advance others to advance yourself drilling down to a quote from the late great zig ziglar where he says if you help enough other people in life get what you want you will eventually get what you want and people want peace of mind people want their problems solved and networking is a way to do that and if you build relationships with people and they don't have to be your closest friends sometimes your biggest opportunities come from quote-unquote weak ties like opportunities just come from out of nowhere sometimes strangers can be the new family at times because they may have a listening ear as opposed to family where they may see you where you were 10 years ago doing a whole 10 year challenge like Facebook <laughs> and they're still focused on the 10 year the you from 10 years ago as opposed to the you 10 years into the present where you're still growing and getting better and you're totally different and almost unrecognizable in terms of your behavior your characteristics and the moves you're making in life as opposed to just the physical appearance so connection awareness is about connecting with wonderful people across the wonderful world and being a magnet for people. Yes. And then you also talk about habit awareness, which everything that we're talking about, everyone, it it goes into the keys to being an elite performance. So he has explained all of these in the book to show you how to become an elite performer. So share with us about um, habit awareness. Ah, uh, yes. Habit awareness. That's right. That's right. Have good habits or you'll have rabbits. That's right. Because <laughs> bad habits tend to multiply <laughs> a lot quicker. <laughs> gotta love a corny joke. Always gotta drop those at least once. But habit awareness, the thumb to put it all together like peanut butter and jelly. The thing is, one of the main habits, and it's probably easy to do and easy not to do, is sleep. Like, one of the major things that have, that was one of the setbacks in life for me was not getting enough sleep because... I, I was actually going through a time, it's been multiple times before, but one time in particular where it stuck out was when I was caregiving for my dying father with Alzheimer's while holding down a full-time job and another volunteer leadership position overseeing a about 17 groups in the northern Baltimore, Maryland area. And all of that led to me not getting enough sleep. I'd be lucky to get maybe two hours of sleep some days. Some days I'd get no sleep. That's dangerous. And yeah, exactly. It's dangerous indeed. Like then you lose at least to getting the caffeine and then gaining a bunch of weight. Another reason why it's important to really make sure that all your habits are in the right place. And when you get less sleep, you're going to drink more coffee, more caffeine products, stuff to keep you awake and jolted all the time. And then that leads you to being short with people. And that's not a place where you need to be, especially when life is customer service. So one of the major habits was making sure I at least get a good six plus hours of sleep every night, at least minimum, and work on that. Of course, increasing water intake as well, because of one of one of the experts I've had on my podcast in the past, she mentions how a lot of folks who get dementia and Alzheimer's is because they're dehydrated. And funny enough, even though it's not funny, is the fact that my father actually was in the hospital a couple of times in the emergency room. And one of the times was because he was dehydrated. Wow. And that dehydration really had his Alzheimer's really set on the deep end where he was sundowning a lot more than usual because he just wasn't drinking enough water. We offered him water multiple times, but juices, he would prefer those because, hey, it tastes good, but the waters, he just wouldn't drink it. So water and sleep, make sure you get both effectively and a lot. <laughs> there are definitely habits that we can utilize for this body so we could 
uh, utilize it in the best capacity. And there are other habits that will create success for us because they're appropriate habits that accumulate, as you said, the bunnies, it accumulates. And <laughs> you do the uh, the right habits and the, uh, the beneficial habits, you could see that your uh, life also goes toward, um, you know, the blessings and the gratitude that you can have about all that you have. And um, you also started a podcast, Going North. How come? How come you wanted to uh, share yourself not only through the book, but also through the podcast? Oh, yeah, definitely had to share myself. Got to spread the chocolate everywhere, right? Like, who doesn't like chocolate, right? And the thing was, like, my mantra, advance others to advance yourself. It's all about really helping other authors get their stories out there, get the word out about their books, the programs, their offerings, and other things, because myself, my book was published back in October 2016, my first ever book, but then about a good, I guess, nine months later, I had to get back on to marketing the book because I lost track of it due to some setbacks that uh, showed up, and I realized, you know what, how about I make this bigger than myself, how about... I just not ramble every week and invite other authors to come on and get their voices heard. And plus, I get to learn from them as well. So I get to be greedy and generous at the same time. It's like, hey, get to have conversations with folks who probably never talk to me get on any given day. But hey, if I have an audience and they get to learn and we have a great conversation, then that's really what it's all about. So basically inviting authors to come on, talk about their books, promote themselves, and just build up those wonderful connections so that way that hey we can be better together and not butter together beautiful what are the some of the habits that you um can share um in one minute or so about um the habits that the elite performance can do every day to create the result that they want sure thing so two stick out so one a good day starts the night before so setting your day up for success by starting the night before so making sure you try to keep your eyes away from those bright screens at least an hour before going to bed and asking yourself powerful questions like one, what good will I do today? And two, what can I share? Focusing on creating good in the world and sharing something positive with the world and then also reflecting at the end of the day and asking yourself, what did I learn today and what good did I do today? So if you focus on learning and growing and giving and sharing, then you'll definitely set yourself up for success like an elite performer. Beautiful. Stay the course, everyone. The Elite Performance, Seven Secret Keys to Sustainable Success by Dominique Brightman. Dominique, if, um, is there anything we haven't shared that you really, really want everybody to know? Oh, there's so much. I wish we could have like 99 episodes for the whole year. It'll just be the doctor and the Dom show. But <laughs> well, what? <Yeah. laughs> Oh, yeah, it'll be fun. But uh, definitely one thing to remind folks is that you matter. No matter what's going on in the world, if you can keep calm while everybody else is losing their minds, hopefully not everybody else losing their minds, then you'll definitely be a cut above everybody else. Remind, so always tell yourself, look in the mirror, tell yourself that you matter no matter what the circumstances. You have value. If you're alive, living and breathing, you have value, you matter, and never forget that you truly matter. Beautiful. And everyone, you can go, uh, where can they go to get your book? Oh, it's right there. Oh, on yeah, the top of right. your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something is a replacement for the Halo while on, on camera. So head over to DomBrightman.com for all things Dom related. And you can buy the book, subscribe to the Going North podcast as well. And be on the lookout when hopefully Dr. Fujian makes her appearance on the show. <laughs> I would be honored. I'll be there definitely. Um, I love what you said. Anything Dom related, anything Dom related, <laughs> you go to dombrightman.com. I love that. Everyone, Dom Brightman, um, stay the course. The elite performance, seven secret keys to sustainable success. If you're only listening to us and you're not viewing us, I want you to know it is amazing to sit with Dom because he's consistently dancing and creates dance movements in within you. Like it's it's uh it's the movement and the rhythm that is like it's uh, not I think uh it's soothing and exciting at the same time. So it was a joy to have you Dom with me. Woohoo, glad the feelings are mutual. Uh, don't go anywhere, everyone. We'll be right back.
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dr. Kukan Zane, and I have E.A. Solkovitz with me. He is the founder of Givers University, author of The Giver's Mindset, The Giver's Lifestyle, and The Giver's Lifelong Learning for the Give to Be Great series. And he is the founder of The Giver University. So um, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on your great show. Thank you. I love uh, the first thing that caught my eyes was Giver University. So um, first of all, I the couple of things I'm just going to throw out there. Um, the distinction and definition of giver, like versus taker, mm -hmm. and then why a university? Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I, I want to say to all your listeners, we love everybody. I say it emphatically. We love everybody. And we teach a skill set that uh, I have to share that, you know, I've just, I haven't seen anyone else teaching it. It's very unique in that um, we teach people how to separate the person who we love from their deeds, which we may not love. And with that distinction, we call it discernment, <clears throat> and then we actually help people. So when we use the term giver, we're not labeling people. We don't label people. What we're doing is we're labeling their deeds, giver deeds. And when we say taker, we're not labeling a person, you know, that human is a taker. We're labeling taker deeds. And we actually even do this by checklist. So we actually, because, you know, when, when we say, you know, we actually did a quiz some time ago and, uh, you know, are you a giver or a taker? And no one would take it because <laughs> no one wanted to find out. <laughs> and, <laughs> And so we thought, well, we got to relook at this. You know, this is a sort of a different way of uh, keeping track here. <clears throat> and it has a, like when, a morality. Um, it really does. Like if you're a taker, it's bad. And if it's yeah, your, right. it's really good. Yeah. And, and everyone, you know, wants to think, you know, they're good people, you know, deep down kind of thing. So and so we got into the details and and. You know, I see so many broad, innocuous swaths of information that say things, but we wanted to get into the extra detail, you know, very granular. How do you discern? I mean, how do you know? It's like I was talking with a gentleman a few interviews ago, and he said, boy, this is really great stuff. And I read this book, and it said I got to have five good people around me. And I said, you're right, you do. One question, which five? Mm -hmm. And he stared at me with his blank look. I said, you see my point? I said, the information's accurate. I said, but how do we discern and what do we do? So we teach how to actually look, what to actually look for, what deeds to observe, what are they doing by virtue of actual checklists. Look at these things. And if they're doing these things, then you can decide, should I bring them in closer into what we call our giver community, bring them closer into your life? Or if I see them doing these other things, the actual deeds, maybe I should consider respectfully distancing myself, not rude or nasty, respectfully distancing myself, because if I bring that person closer, they're going to make me collateral damage and I'm going to be stomping out fires not of my making and my stress level is going to go through the roof. So we teach people this skill of how to discern in our relationships. And we use that reference of giver deeds and taker deeds to do it. So what is the difference between giver deeds and taker deeds? We actually have a checklist of 25 deeds that does just that. Uh, and they actually look through and on the left side, it's got all what a giver would be doing with these 25 instances. And on the right side, what a taker would be doing in those 25 instances. And on the bottom, it's just, you just total up the check marks. And then automatically, you know, by looking. And one of the great things, doctor, is that they're not eternally. I mean, if someone is, you know, sort of in what we call takerish mode, you know, uh, they're not there eternally. And, and we help people, you know, get back more into that giver side. And, and, and one of the reasons we chose the name to back to your question on Givers University, um, well, it has to do with my business mentor, who I made a commitment to at the ripe old age of 19, um, that I would share with others everything that he taught me. And one of the things he taught me, which was very extraordinary that I'd like to share with your listeners. Um, and he said, you know, and I'm at like 19 years old, so I'm a kid at this point. And he, and, uh, he, he said, uh, I want to teach you about this thing called life. And I said, okay. He said, picture in your mind this scale. And on the right side of the scale, all the things you're going to get in life, all the things you're going to receive. And he said, on the left side of the scale, all the things you're going to give and contribute. He said, now, what's amazing about this scale is it's never out of balance. He says it strives for balance all the time. He said, so what I'm going to say is going to be a little difficult for you in the beginning, but you'll get the hang of it. Forget about the right side. 
Forget about it. He said, make it your daily goal to heave so much on the left side that you, your goal is to get the scale out of balance by having so much on that left side. He said, and you'll never have to worry about what's on the right side and what you'll get and what you'll receive. And I can share with me, with you, that absolutely over and over again, you know, four, 40 plus years in business absolutely works. Absolutely. One of the things that I've noticed also is that there's this distinct difference uh, in, in my world, um, in a sense, between a receiving uh, sentiment and a taking sentiment. Oh, for sure. You know, receiving, there's an openness with uh, with uh, with love, with gratitude, with uh, somewhere that someone wants to give me something and I'm actually uh, giving them back by receiving it. And it's not like, you know, I'm denying it or um, uh, or not appreciating it. Because when someone other than, you know, other person wants to give me as I open my heart to receive, that's also a part of the giving factor because I'm opening the space versus a taking concept, which is, more like, you know, I have, the, whether it's the entitlement that I have or um, a sense that, you know, I'm going to take something from you as if you no longer have it and I need it and I'm going to take it. And it doesn't have necessarily the concept of love and appreciation and gratitude to it. Uh, that's a little bit of a um, understanding that I have between those two terms. And then with the giver and taker, as, as I also understood, is most everybody has both sides. So it's not like whether I'm, you know, I born one and I create, you know, I'm always a giver or I'm born a taker and I'm that. Like you said, there are actual behaviors, sentiments, um, uh, ways of thinking that could be both. And then what I hear from you is you're saying we do have all of it. It's just, as you heard it from your mentor, can I put my focus and attention on uh, giving of myself? and being out there and, and loving and holding the space for others and thinking of others. And that's how I promote this other side of me, which would appear to be off balance a bit. Yeah, I agree. And uh, well stated, as a matter of fact, uh, very pointed. The, uh, it, it had a lot of its intention, you know, when we go into a scenario and we're all a work in progress, you know, we all are and, uh, and we're in our lives are self-fulfilling prophecies. And, uh, but they have a gauge where we can not only self-assess, because with all of this, there's a self-assessment part that's built in, you know, and I see, you know, I'm looking at this list of 25, I say, oh, number 13, yeah. I fell off the rails on that one. I need to get back on the rail. So there's a self-assessment part that, you know, we, we constantly are working on, but there's a way to do it. See, there, there, there is a way to self-assess. And the same thing when we're being not judgmental, but discerning and observing what other people are doing, not what they're saying, but what, what they're doing. Uh, because one of the things we like to say in Givers University is your talk talks and your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. And by the way, I practiced that right before I said it. So I never said it. <laughs> the, I'll say it three and, times. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not going to say that with peanut butter in my mouth and crackers. So the, uh, but the, uh, and, and so we teach, you know, and, I, and I, I'm excited about being able to do that. And, and what we've done most recently is began to discern giver communities with taker communities. And what's the difference between those two? And, you know, you, you hear the word today. People say, well, join my community, be a part of my community, and they invite you in, and two hours later, they're trying to sell you everything under the sun, you know, and, and, and that's not a community, that's a customer list, right? And, and why do the bait and switch on me? You know, I mean, just call it what it is, and then I'll decide, yes, I'm interested in your products, I'll learn about them, et cetera, but don't call it a community and then bait and switch. Um, you know, for your listeners, interesting, I could use an example. The word community has, it, it's... It's taken on a new meaning, and I could use as the example the word diet. You know, years ago, spelled D-I-E-T, when you went to a meeting with two or three people, you went to a diet. That was the meeting was called a diet. Then later on, years later, spelled the same way. If I received an allowance or a stipend, my weekly allowance or monthly allowance would be called a diet. I received a diet, right? Then as I was growing up, the word diet meant eating habits. It was the way I ate, right? And now you say diet and it means weight loss. Always spelled the same way, D-I-E-T, totally different meanings over the years. And we've seen, in my opinion, doctor, this emergence of so-called communities or what I call taker communities that are not really communities and not really, you know, so the definition that I could give with your listeners of a taker community is a taker community is designed with the intention to get something from you, to earn money off of you, 
And the whole intention from the very beginning is with that intention. A giver's community is exactly the opposite. Um, my business mentor came to me with that amazing contest, if I can share it with you, because it's a, it, it, it's a very thought-provoking contest as well. Uh, I'd worked my way up in being a partner with him, and we were splitting everything 50-50. And he had diabetes in the, uh, the worst way. It took his life early, uh, decades ago, as a matter of fact. And, but one day he came up to me, and he said, EA, I'd like to have us compete. And he had that look in his eye. I knew that glimmer. I knew that, you know, I thought, oh, boy, this is going to be really interesting. And he said, uh, I said, you'd like to have us compete? And he says, yes, this is what I propose. I propose that we compete each year to see who can make the other one more money. And whoever loses, the loser has to buy the winner anything they want. I said, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> okay, before I agree to this, I make sure I understand what you just proposed. All right, what you're saying, Sam, his name was Sam Robbins, and uh, God bless him. I still think he's looking over my shoulder, making sure I'm fulfilling my vow and commitment to him. But the, he, he, I said, okay, Sam, what you're saying is, all right, we're going to compete each year, and if you make me more money than I made you, I lose, you win. Because you made me more money, you get to ask me anything that, I, that you want and I have to buy it for you. And he said, yes. And I said, okay, now the other side of the coin is true, right? Also, if, if I make you more money, I get to ask for anything I want and you have to buy it. He said, yes. Well, doctor, the first year, he beat me so bad, it wasn't even funny. It was brutal. And I paid cash for a house for him in Florida. And I couldn't be mad. I had the money. He had made me more money than I made him. I thought, man, I got to get smart because this is going to get brutal if I, don't, if I don't figure this out. And the next year I won and he bought me a plane. That's when I became a commercial pilot. The next year he bought me a limousine. The next year he bought me a second plane. And then we started carrying it forward. And doctor, that's when it hit me. What he had really done because of his diabetes and because, you know, I mean, he was, you know, three decades my senior. He knew he wasn't going to be able to keep up. And since we were splitting everything 50-50, he wanted me to win. He wanted me to have that thing that he wasn't getting so my mind wouldn't get screwed up because we were splitting everything 50-50 and he knew he couldn't keep up with me. I was in my mid-30s, right? So I thought, man, what kind of man comes up with that? Mm -hmm. What kind of man can play that forward in his mind? Think of what might happen craft something like that and come to me with that and I, I, I love him today more than ever even though he's decades gone and uh, what, a, what an amazing man I was blessed to have him as a mentor but we call that it became one of the cornerstones in Givers University we call that the Givers Contest Intention mm -hmm. and doctor that's what sets a Givers community dramatically apart from a taker community, we it's one it's one of it's it's our intention. We call it the Givers Contest intention, and that means we 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 share with people how they can build their own. We want them to build their own. You know, there was a book out years ago, uh, still out today. Uh, it's called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I'm sure many of your listeners are familiar with it. Yes, and and, and, and Napoleon does a masterful job of talking about the mastermind principle, right? And uh, but in the course at that time, when the book was written, it was very novel, you know, something very breaking, you know, kind of thing, the latest thing. Uh, but he never really gets into how do you do it. And I saw in my lifetime a lot of mastermind groups uh, uh, that came together and, you know, a group of people. But then within two or three months, they just sort of dissipate. They just sort of go their own way. And I realized that there was really a need here because... We need to surround ourselves with the right kind of people, but no one's teaching us how do we do it. Once you know, discernment's a part of it, but then also how do we put that group around us in our life so that we don't we're not stomping out fires and all these things. So that became what we call the givers junto. Um, and can I give some examples of some different juntos in the past with other people and how they've worked, uh, even in historically? Please, I just got goosebump when you t shared about that experience because I yeah. think that the intention of um, and and seeing how much you know you can be for others in a way that it it comes back regardless. So you have a system um, that this the system is already thinking about the bigger game and is thinking about a bigger success game than um, you know your yourself. So it's this expansion 
um, that you're already envisioning and you're envisioning not only you getting on top and winning it all, but you're envisioning a whole community together going forward. And that's that's the beauty of what I'm hearing from you. Thank you. And, and you know, uh, the an example would be one of them is called the Giver's Junto. We use the term Junto instead of a community, which still means a Junto basically is a group of people getting together for a common purpose. And that's a Junto, right? And you know, if, you, if someone had a group of a dozen people, and if all of them, and, and a critical part of this, Doctor, is what I call the expectational agreement up front. These are the things we're going to agree to up front. And one of those things is that as a member of this group, we each have and accept and agree to up front a fiduciary responsibility that we're going to put everyone else's interests in front of our own. And when we have a group of people that are equally committed, think of the power that comes out of that when here each person individually through the contest intention is competing to give more to the group than they're getting and the other 11 are doing the same thing. What comes out of that is incredibly, incredibly powerful because then we're not thinking, well, you know, I'm afraid to give because what if they take advantage of me and what if they do this and what if they do that? All the things that cause people to hold back when they have that great opportunity. So having that intention, the what I call expectational agreement, this is what we expect. And if you're not good with that, no problem. God bless you. It's just not a good fit for you. But if it is, we would welcome you and we we have an accountability here with each other. This is what we do. So uh, it, and my business mentor taught me the value in that. And I had one gentleman say, he goes, you know, it sounds really utopian. I said, it may sound that way, but I can tell you it's not. I lived it. I lived it in my life. Yeah, I think there's a beauty in what you just um, explained, which is it's not uh, it's not in people's head and intention and intention is not just from one way. It's stated in a way that a group of people who are agreeing, they're holding themselves accountable and responsible, holding each other accountable and responsible. So it really comes from this just a mental utopia or a mental fantasy into an actual space where people are agreeing, they're looking at it, their, uh, their uh, actions are involved, actions are um, evaluated by everybody moving forward. The, the, the context is different. It, this could be done in any level of business or- Absolutely. You know, um, um, the contractual aspect of any business where people come in, they know exactly what they want from each other, contracts are then. So this is exactly like any business. What you're sharing is that the context is different where the, you know, a, a, an original context for a business is that I will profit, I will give you some stuff, but the point of a business is I will profit. And the context that I'm hearing from you is we're all giving. And the point is that, my intention is to have so much giving to you uh, that it just bursts the community up, whether this community is two people or 10 people or thousands of people. That's where the context and the, and the um, four vision is. Exactly I'm right. I'm so excited to hear this. This is awesome. Yeah. I'm telling you, my, I'm getting goosebumps. I love <laughs> this. The, the, the word junto, which we use, actually is a Spanish word goes back to like the 1600s, um, wasn't used much. And then in the 1700s, it was picked up by a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Franklin. And uh, in 1727, Benjamin Franklin got together a group of a dozen friends, 12, guy, 12 people, and they, he, he formed what he called the Mutual Improvement Club. And they met every Friday for a couple of hours and they talked about everything. They talked about politics and morals and ethics and business and social life. And then later on, he, uh, Ben Franklin called that his Junto. And then later on, he called it the Leather Apron Club. Now, what's interesting about that, Doctor, is that arguably our very Declaration of Independence could be traced all the way back to the conversations he had in his Junto with those 12 people. So no one can tell me a Junto can't be powerful yeah. uh, when people get together for the right reason. And, uh, and then and we teach, basically, we help people build three different kinds of Junto. These are theirs. We want, you know, it's theirs. We don't charge us. We don't, we want, this is something we just feel is important because we're heaving everything we can on that left side of the scale, and that's our, our objective. There's a greater Junto, which is any number of people. It can be worldwide. They get together for a common purpose. Good example might be Salvation Army, VFW, Lions, uh, Lions Club. Those would be good examples, right? 
Then there's the insider junto, two to 12 people, more close knit, more intimate group, know each other better. Um, that's called the insider junto. And then we have the, what we call the millionaires junto. And those are two to 12 vetted millionaires, literally vetted millionaires who are all coming together for a common purpose. Good example that would be in uh, 1915, Henry Ford mm -hmm. formed a millionaire junto with himself, Thomas Edison, Harvey Firestone, and John Burroughs. John Burroughs was a, uh, he was actually a writer and a poet, and uh, he was also a federal bank examiner. So I can only guess he must have been the money guy. But anyway, the, uh, so, the, so, and there was the four of them in this Junto, right? And Henry Ford called themselves, he sort of named them the Four Vagabonds. And they traveled together, and it was a very intimate group, and they, and they helped each other and contributed. And certainly Henry Ford's and Harvey Firestone and uh, Thomas Edison, none of their lives were any worse off, but dramatically increased as a result. So, uh, and, I, and I'm recognizing our time here, so I just want to hit something that just sort of, because it's such a critical part for your listeners. There's seven steps in forming a Junto. And I just want to hit them really quick, just for, and they can listen to this over and over again, you know, re-listen to this. Uh, it, it spells out the word discern, and it's an acronym. So these are the seven steps in forming a Junto. Number one, decide. You have to decide. That's the D. And we give checklists and teaching people, how do you decide? What are the things you look for? I is invite. How do you invite these, assumably, uh, 12 people on an insider Junto? How do you go about doing that? S is seed. The seed part is where you meet with them and you get that expectational agreement. These are the things we're doing. This is why we're meeting. This is what we expect of each other. This is the accountability we have. And if it doesn't fit, no problem. And if one of us falls off the rails, we have a conversation about it. And if we fall off a second time, then we need to part ways and no problem. That, that's great. We love you. Great, right? Uh, the, after the S is convene. The C in discern is for convening on a regular basis, whether it be weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, just convene on a regular basis. Next is E, establish, give it a name. Ben Franklin, the Leather Apron Club, uh, Henry Ford, uh, the Four Vagabonds. Give, it, give the group an identity, give it a name because that helps from a camaraderie standpoint. Very important. And then the R is rotate. Um, each meeting, have a different person who's the chair. Go around the room. Don't have any one person that's chairing it all the time. Uh, have a different person each time. We even provide agendas for people. Say, okay, that, you know, give this to the chair this time, and these are the questions you ask. Because part of what we like to do is give it some glue so that there's a longevity involved in it by giving it some structure and giving it an agenda long term that helps every person in the group with whatever their objectives and goals are. And the last one, the N, is for numbers. You can become a part of more than one Junto. They should try to seed other Juntos in other countries today with things like we're doing even with our interview here with Zoom. You know, it, it's so easy to be able to do these things uh, worldwide and probably intergalactically future. Uh, you know, but for right now, it, you know, who knows? We're, but we're able to become a part of multiple Juntos as a part. So we're very strong advocates for mentoring. Um, we're very strong advocates for forming the right kind of community around you and teaching people how to discern in their relationships so they can be so much more happy and, and, and so much more productive in their lives. And so and as I hear you, I'm assuming that this is not only around business ideas. So people- Oh, for sure. Yeah, people can get together and say, um, we all are committed to <clears throat> eradicate poverty, let's say, in the, around the world. So uh, then they can come up with ideas and different aspects and they can have their numbers on how many countries they do, or uh, they can, you know, talk about ideas and then see, I mean, obviously any of these ideas would still take, you know, finances and this and that, but some of it, uh, like the first group you were talking about is um, how much can I get you richer? Another one is uh, how can I also, as I hear you take this concept and uh, open like this when you talked about Salvation Army to take it into a whole different aspect of um, community given. Uh, so anybody uh, could really come into this concept of what you said. You said at the beginning, you pay it forward and connect with everybody else who have the same ideas and really play big, play bigger than they could do at any point on their own because they're focusing on um, on getting each other uh, higher and higher on that scale. I love it. I, I love this idea. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for coming and sharing it with us. Everyone, EA, 
Solkovitz, please go to the Giver Minds, um, get the Givers uh, University. How do they find you? Yep, they would actually. Uh, and, and by the way, side note, um, the the Givers Juntos can be used for any aspect of business, personal, social. They can have social juntos. They can have family juntos. You know, I mean, uh, there, there's no aspect that it is not going to benefit them to ha- be discerning in who they have around them uh, and uh, be have that competition going of who can contribute more. They simply go to giversuniversity.com. Just that simple. Uh, and uh, and if they sign up for a newsletter, we give them a free, the 25 checklist I mentioned. Uh, they get that literally within two hours after. We want them to download it, use it. Print off the checklist, use it in your discerning, in business, use it with, you know, the, the people you're associating with, even with family members, you know, and in and, and, and social life. We love all of them, but be discerning as to who you pull in close and build your junto with. Beautiful. Uh, last word of wisdom in a minute. Anything we haven't said and you really want everybody to know. The three things my business mentor taught me to say four decades ago to myself, and he got me to say it to myself every day of my life. And as fortunes came and went and came and went and came and went in my life, I always said these three things to myself every day, and I share them with your listeners. I will never give up. I will keep rising up, and I will always overcome. Beautiful. Thank you so much for taking the time and being on our show. Thank you for having me, Dr. And for everyone who's out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Until next week, bye-bye.